Hello and welcome back to Reality Check. Something is buzzing our military installations, and that's official. <clears throat> Today on Reality Check, we're looking at the prevalence of unidentified anomalous phenomena, some might say drones, UAVs, over military facilities. And one of them that we're taking a very close look at is the Langley Air Force Base. You may have seen an article in The War Zone, which is an excellent online publication uh, in which um, Joe Trethewick and uh, Tyler Rogaway wrote a piece about so-called drone swarms in December last year. Take a look at this video. This is a video shot by a local who was standing on the front lawn of his beach house near Langley Air Force Base across the water, filming on the evening of December 14th, right after sunset. He was watching what was meant to be that night's meteor shower. He says that around 7.15, he began to see red blinking lights from the direction of Virginia Beach coming in high and circling north of Langley Air Force Base, heading west and then passing directly over the base, heading east and back in the direction they came. It began as one or two coming every few minutes, and at its peak, he said I would say there would be upwards of five over the base that would sometimes stop and hover directly over the base. This witness says they were always blinking from white to reddish orange. The blinking wasn't uniform, and these weren't planes. The lights were not on the ends of wings or rotors. They were round orbs of light. He's very clear on that point, this witness, which does tend to suggest some questioning to the drones explanation that's given in the war zone periodical. It's a line that... Um, uh, has been pushed by many in the defence media for some time that the simplest explanation for what we're seeing here is drones. But are they? So we have a late-breaking development on this reality check story. The man who shot the videos, Jonathan Butner, has agreed to speak audio only to reality check. He was across the water from Langley Air Force Base on the evening in question on, in December, and he's now willing to give us his account of what he saw. And the fascinating thing is, he's pretty sure what he saw was indeed anomalous, not some kind of commercial drone, helicopter or other aircraft. Good evening, Jonathan Butner. Hello, Ross. So, Jonathan, tell me what you saw in December last year. I, I understand we won't say exactly where, but you were in a premises in a residence that was across the water from Langley Air Force Base. Tell me where you were roughly and what you started seeing. Uh, yes, sir. So, yes, I was uh, at a residence up on the southern side of the James River at about 7 p.m. on uh, Thursday, December 14th. Uh, the sun was just going down for the evening, and it was supposed to be a meteor shower that night. So I was I was there, you know, just planning on watching that. Uh, you know, directly across from me is Fort Eustace, Eustace then Newport News, and then Langley is uh, off in the, the distance as well. Uh, but I began to see, right after the sun went down, I began to see these reddish orange blinking lights that's, that started coming from the southeast of me crossing the James River. Um, they began one, two, three at a, t at a time, kind of you know, almost in a conveyor belt fashion. Uh, they would go north of Langley Air Force Base. Uh, it was what it appeared to me, which was about, I would say, 11 or 12 miles away, and then head towards uh, the west, uh, past it. But then they would kind of slowly turn and then go straight back over uh, where the, I perceived the, where the base would be. Uh, it kind of confirmed to me that it was Langley, when I would sometimes see a, a searchlight that would start flashing from the ground and kind of wave back and forth uh, 
uh, never really focusing on any of them as they went past, but just kind of like just waving back and forth. Uh, the the orbs, um, I would say, looked about car sized. I mean, just from that distance. And they kept a very steady pace until they got over that location in which they would start hovering over over the base. Now, can I ask you this, sir? The official explanation at the moment is not really forthcoming, but the word drone has been used, i.e. to suggest that perhaps this is some kind of commercial or perhaps military drone of some kind. Is what you saw that night consistent with what you would think of as a drone? Well, I think you know, a lot of people seem to think that a drone is like kind of what we're used to seeing, something that you could put in a backpack and control with a remote control. Uh, I mean, these were large and they seem orb shaped. Uh, I, you know, you, you could say the the word drone, uh, you know, I, I have no ways of knowing if they were manned or not, but these were not not the drones with four blades on, on the edges. Uh, these were you, certain... Can I ask you this? Do you think you would have yeah. heard, obviously you're over water, which does tend to amplify noise. If there were the helicopter propellants, propellers, if, if this was like a conventional drone with helicopter propellers, would you have heard it, do you think? Um, it, you know, it was quite a distance. I would say it's probably over 10 miles, the, the ones that were going over the base. Um, but yeah, I've seen a lot of uh, helicopters and I've seen a lot of planes from, from that vantage point. And I know what, you know, wings look like with the green light on one end and one red on the other. Or if it was a, a Black Hawk with a, t a tail rotor and also uh, lights around there, you know, th these orbs were the lights and they would go directly from that reddish orange right to white it was not like a blinking on and off and the, the blinking was not uniform either uh to me it looked like sometimes the orbs would be blinking at different beats as they went over the base uh and it would sometimes change as i watched them it's, it's it appeared to me so it's, it's very unusual and not like anything I've ever seen on a, on a regular so that, aircraft. So that's interesting. So this isn't the kind of, because the, the thing that made me think that they were probably drones was that you do see these intermittent flashing lights, but they're not lights that are consistent with the kind of lights you'd see that are frequently following an exact pattern, a frequency on a drone or on a helicopter or on an aircraft. Correct. Yes. These did not in my opinion, did not appear to be like FAA regulated blinking lights on, on planes and, uh, uh, with, with, that are on the ends of wings. They, they seem to, to move uniformly. Uh, one, in one of my videos, you can see where two of the orbs kind of pull apart in distance and one's beating in almost like triplet and one's beating in more of a heartbeat path, a uh, heartbeat uh, type rhythm. Uh, so, you know, it, it, yeah, it was very, very unusual. I think you also mentioned in your earlier conversation with me off camera that there was another type of object that you saw that night. I don't want to lead you, so tell me what else you saw. Yeah, so, so I probably saw about 40 of the smaller drones that were at a higher elevation. 40? That would, I, would, I would say so, yes. Uh, 40 total, drones? Now, so, yeah, so let's I, let's not use the drone word because that's a very loaded word. <laughs> you, you you saw forty orb type objects. What color were they? Uh, they would go from the reddish orange to white light, uh, uh, changing from one shade of that light, the reddish orange to white, and even back and forth. Wow! Um, so, th so this isn't this isn't like a. I mean, I, I noticed the war zone used the terminology drone. Th this isn't something that's consistent with something that's the size of a even a commercial drone. A commercial drone is possibly, what, a metre across. You're describing yes. something that's the size of a car. It's changing colour, and the flashing lights on it are changing colour and varying intermittently. Yes, yes. And then they would follow the exact path around and then back over uh, Langley and sometimes stopping to hover over the base 
before they would go back out at that southeasterly direction they came from, like towards uh, the Virginia Beach area from where I was. And so what was this other object that you saw? Now, to me, this looked uh, very different. It would come from the same direction as the, uh, I will say smaller, but the car-sized orbs. And this, it would come down over the northern bank of the James River. So this was probably closer to four miles uh, directly past me. It moved uh, right westward on on the river past Fort Eustis. And this looked, the bottom was a glowing orangish red, uh, kind of uh, lens shaped, uh, semicircular, uh, and it appeared to have three white lights uh, at the, the top of it. Uh, and, and it moved probably slightly above the tree level I was very slowly right in front of me. I uh, went past three times. So this was either three separate vehicles or the same vehicle or or uh, you know, craft uh, going circling around three times. Uh, and in my opinion, it kind of looked like it was monitoring or, or observing everything that was going on over Langley. So you seem to be describing a mothership. Uh, yes, that's that's. A, I, I would say that a command command control is something that came to mind while did, I watched did, it. Did you see any of the objects coming from that object? No, they it would seem to it seemed to come in separately uh, uh, and run that different course than the orbs that were coming in and, and running uh, their their pattern. Uh, and how long did you see these objects for overall? And what time of night was this, John? Uh, the first one I saw was probably right at 7.15. Uh, it peaked, I would say, around 8 p.m. That, that evening. And then just like it began, it, it trickled down to a slow line. And the last one I saw was probably right before 9 p.m., which is when I went inside. Now... As I understand it, our good friend Ryan Graves, who I'm also interviewing for this program, he's helped you get on to the FBI who are investigating this case. Is that correct? Yes, sir. I have spoken with them as well, detailing what I saw. And was their interest piqued by the fact that you clearly are not describing what I think anyone would describe as a commercial or known military drone? Um, I, I, would, I wouldn't want to speak for them, but they did. Uh, they were interested, and I'm, I, I'm, I was glad to be able to discuss with them, uh, you know, what what I saw, and uh, hopefully they'll be able to do, you know, their due diligence with that. Sure. So, have you been approached at all by anybody from the Defense Department, the U.S. Air Force, or perhaps even from ARO, the uh, All Domain Anomaly Resolution Office? Uh, no, sir. Not at this time. W would you be prepared to speak to them and give evidence to them if you were asked? Uh, yes, I'm. Uh, I'm willing to tell my story and uh, and and help in any way I can with any kind of investigation. So, John, can I say this? I I actually think I speak for a lot of people when I say it's very easy to get stigmatized and ridiculed for coming forward with sightings of UAPs. I just want to put it on the record. Well done to you for being willing to come forward, for having the courage to speak publicly, uh, and, and well done to you also for speaking to the authorities. Thank you. I greatly appreciate that. And I want to say it's been watching people like you and Ryan Graves uh, and others who have spoken out. It's really been a, a reinforcement on this. No, thank you. And I, I I really appreciate that because we're in this weird situation at the moment where particularly the US Air Force is very reluctant to make any kind of admissions about UAPs. We've had that, I think, very silly UAP historical report that was done by Arrow just in the last few weeks, which discounted the possibility that this is anything anomalous. Let me ask you this way. Do you think it's more likely than not that the objects you saw that December night last year were still an open mystery, anomalous, or do you think they are plausibly explainable as 
some kind of drone technology? Uh, I, in my my opinion is that I believe they are anomalous and that they do, do uh, deserve to have a thorough investigation and to find out what, what they are and where, where they're coming from. Which all begs the question, why is the Pentagon so determined to put this back in a box? Here are you, a resident, a loyal, patriotic American citizen wanting to come forward with evidence. And good on the FBI for taking your evidence. Let's just hope they run with it properly and give it all the credible investigative analysis that it deserves. I agree. It's been frustrating watching uh, what has happened to the, the Schumer bill, which was held back by a handful of uh, politicians. And it's been frustrating to see that recent report from Arrow and the Pentagon. Uh, you know, I really feel that it is time that we are told the truth to what is going on here. Uh, you know, I feel, you know, we're sitting on a on a beach and we have a tsunami of truth that could be possibly coming at us. Um, we're s sitting with our lifeguards, not not telling us what what is truly happening and, and protecting us. Well, good on you very much, John. And um, listen, would you let us know if you are approached by the Defence Department? And obviously, if you suffer any harassment at all or any kind of intimidation, we've got your back. So let us know, please, if you do suffer any kind of intimidation or retribution for coming forward with this account. Yes, yes, sir. I definitely will do that. And thank you so much for your support. Great. Thank you so much, John. And um, uh, just to verify the videos that we're using, those are videos that you recorded. You're personally responsible for shooting those videos. Yes, sir. And how many minutes of video overall did you record? Um, I would estimate maybe around 10 minutes total, and I took a, a handful of pictures. Did you have anybody with you that night? Were there any other corroborative witnesses who can back that you saw what you say you saw? Uh, unfortunately, no. It, it was just me that evening. And were there neighbours also looking at this weird phenomena that you were looking at across the water? I, I've not heard any of them speak up or, or say that any of them uh, happened to see it. And uh, one other thing, I noticed that in the war zone story from Tyler Rogaway and Joseph Trethewick, um, they talk about the fact that there was a NASA reconnaissance plane that was brought in. Were you there when that plane was doing its sorties over the Langley Air Force Base? I did not witness that um, during the evening of my what I saw. I really did not notice any aircraft, uh, you know, from what I did see in that article, I was wondering if that that plane may have been very high to where I wouldn't have been able to really see it. But I did not notice any uh, military or commercial aircraft uh, during the, the night uh, of, of what I witnessed out, outside of the anomalies. And it was the one evening when you were doing this sighting and recording. Yes, sir. Yeah. John, thank you so much for speaking to Reality Check and well done for coming forward. And I sincerely hope we get some answers from the FBI on what they find into your sighting. Thank you so much. I appreciate everything. Now, I've spoken to this witness, and so has our guest today, Ryan Graves, a former FA-18 pilot who has actually flown out of Langley Air Force Base and knows well the issue of anomalous objects hovering over the Virginia coast. And what's very interesting is this witness does not believe that these objects, whatever they are, can be easily explained away as commercial drones. He says they didn't behave like a commercial drone. And the one thing that does puzzle me is if you were some kind of non-human intelligence or some kind of stealth technology coming in to get a peek at a US military base, why would you have flashing lights? Now, that's the issue we're going to explore today on Reality Check. And let me now bring in our first guest for today, Ryan Graves. Ryan Graves is a former lieutenant in the U.S. Navy, a former F-A-18 fighter pilot. 
He's the co-founder and executive director of Americans for Safe Aerospace, which is essentially a, a non-profit dedicated to military and commercial aircrew impacted by UAP and the pursuit of UAP transparency. And you'll know him because in July last year, July 2023, in what was the first public congressional hearing into UAPs in over 50 years, 54 years in fact, Ryan was one of two former US Navy fighter pilots who decided to testify under oath about UAPs being a potential national security and safety of flight issue. Now, his F-18 squadron during 2014-2015 was operating off the coast of Virginia Beach, training in a training area set aside for fighter military aircraft. And they observed and tracked UAPs that had infiltrated military airspace. And as you'll see today, Ryan Graves takes this issue very seriously indeed. He doesn't think it's an issue that deserves to be treated with flippancy or dismissiveness, which frankly, I suspect is what has characterised much of the attitude from the Pentagon's UAP office, Arrow, the all-domain anomaly resolution office, up until now. So today we're going to be talking to Ryan Graves about the implications of this latest video from Langley Air Force Base, one of apparently a series of incidents that occurred throughout December where drone swarms were buzzing one of the most sensitive military facilities on the east coast of the United States. This is a base where they have F-22 stealth fighters. It's the forward defence base for the defence of Washington, D.C. and the East Coast. What the hell was it in December 2023 that was buzzing one of our most secure fighter bases? So, Ryan Graves, welcome to Reality Check, and thank you for joining us today. As you know, the Warzone periodical online has been reporting that there were drone swarms over Langley Air Force Base throughout December, and that, in fact, at one stage, a very sophisticated aircraft, the WB-57 aircraft, which is a, a NASA research uh, aircraft, was actually flown in to... Uh, apparently get involved in whatever it was that was being surveilled over the base. Do you have any comment, any response to what's been seen allegedly over Langley Air Force Base? Well, I think it's incredibly important, Ross, that we pay attention and respect the indications that we're seeing from these drone incursions. Uh, it may not seem like that big of a strategic flaw to have these types of uh, drone incursions on a base like this, but it does not take that many UAVs, that many drones to cause a serious national security concern, as we've seen in the Middle East with attacks on pipelines and airports. Do you think there is any evidence at the moment to conclude definitively that they are commercial drones? Well, I haven't seen enough data on this particular case to be able to say one way or another. I know there are reports that these that the government is reporting these as, I believe, UAV incursions. I've heard other uh, eyewitness testimony stating uh, that they've seen things that are a little bit harder to explain. But I think at this point, it's too early in the investigation to say either way. Why does it matter, Ryan? I mean, obviously, you created Americans for Safe Aerospace out of a genuine concern that these objects, whatever they are, they pose a threat, a possible threat to flight safety and possible threat to national security. Why? What, what's your concern? Well, this is this is a perfect example of why we need to be able to identify what's in our airspace and why it's so critically important. Uh, we cannot have vehicles that are operating or within our airspace, especially en masse, as we're seeing here. Otherwise, we're going to have potential serious concerns with general aviation traffic, commercial traffic, and potentially military operations that could be occurring nearby. And let's not forget, these things could be considered weapons themselves. Uh, if there are a number of aircraft on the ground at this base, those would make prime targets for a small explosive. Well, can you explain to us how significant is Langley Air Force Base? Uh, I know it's based near Virginia Beach, across the water from Virginia Beach. It's an area you know well because you've trained there with your fighter squadrons uh, in the, the run-ups to preparations for deployments. 
What is the significance of the Langley Air Force Base? As I understand it, it's got the latest stealth fighter, the F-22. Yeah, absolutely. You know, it's not that dissimilar to the type of operations that we were flying in Virginia Beach ourselves in the F-18. Just further to the north, the Navy is conducting their operations with the F-22, and just further north, we're already into D.C. So this is very congested airspace. It's not airspace where you would be expecting a large number of assets to be uncontrolled and unaccounted for. And yet we've seen repeatedly them to cross into controlled airspace, military bases, and what they're doing, we simply don't know yet. It's clear from the War Zone article that there was a large response to whatever it was that was buzzing Air Force Base Langley. One of the things that characterizes the objects that the witness I've spoken to saw were that these were flashing lights. They were flashing irregularly, but they appeared to have strobing lights on them, reddish, orange, white lights. That doesn't sound like something that would be trying to stealthily operate over a secret government base, something that's protected by high security like Air Force Base Langley. Is it plausible to you that these would be stealth drones that be that are being flown over a base in a way that's intended to be unobtrusive if they're operating flashing lights? Well, no, I don't think they would be intended to be stealth uh, with the way you've just described it. And yes, that's what I've heard as well. We are seeing these objects blinking uh, with white lights, uh, not in the not in the strobe pattern that one would expect due to FAA regulations, but uh, patterns that don't seem to meet any. Uh, anything that I'm aware of. Uh, additionally, the objects apparently uh, have been lit up, the large number of them, while they're operating over the base itself. So um, it did not appear, at least from the information I've received, that these objects were trying to conceal their location or their presence. So this is quite interesting. This is something being operated intelligently in an overt way over a very sensitive military facility. It's almost like it's sticking its tongue out and saying, catch me if you can, because it doesn't appear that they did recover one of these objects. There's no suggestion from any of the reports that are made in the war zone periodical that there's been any capture or any bringing down of a UAV. And yet we do have anti-UAV technology that's meant to be able to bring these things down with some kind of electromagnetic beam weapon. Well, yeah, we would think that we do have those capabilities, but as I believe it was the oncoming uh, Northcom commander said that this was one of the largest priorities or was one of his number one priorities for the first 90 days uh, in his position. And I'm paraphrasing here, but he, he suggested that we simply don't have the national infrastructure to be able to deal with these types of problems. And let's put aside the possibility of, if you like, NHI and non-human intelligence being responsible for these objects for a moment, Brian. Let's just consider the possibility that they are simply some kind of stealthy drone that's been able to insert itself over a, a US military facility in a way that has allowed those objects to operate with impunity. They haven't been brought down. That in and of itself is a grave national security concern, isn't it? Even if these are some kind of drone or UAV being operated by either a, a civilian or potentially unfriendly foreign adversary. Absolutely, it's a full stop situation. And we don't have to know where they're from to know it's a problem. The fact that we have unknown assets operating over those types of facilities is a full stop. Uh, we don't have to determine whether they're foreign adversary or whether they're UAP. All we know is that they are there and we need to have the resources and attention to be able to deal with it. So let's go to what happened to you. I mean, I, I remember, and all credit to you, sir, for having the courage and the strength of mind and personality to make that decision to appear before the Congress last year. Thousands, millions of people watched on as you gave evidence under oath before a congressional committee expressing the concern that you felt about the national security and flight safety risks of what you witnessed during 2014, 2015 off the Virginia coast. What did you witness? Well, between 2014 and 2015, the squadron that I was in, VFA-11 and myself, were seeing on a near daily basis objects on our radar, on our camera systems, or with our eyeballs that we didn't have an explanation for. 
They were performing in ways that our aircraft couldn't. They were out there all day. And they would often be so many of them that we couldn't even work in the areas and we'd have to either move or cancel our flights. And to this day, about eight years later, they are still seeing these objects out there and we still don't know what they are. So you're still in touch with pilots who are operating off the Virginia coast in those training areas who are still seeing these objects? Not just uh, off the Virginia Beach coast, but in the Gulf of Mexico, as well as the Pacific coast as well. Just recently, I was hearing from a pilot uh, who had seen one of these objects uh, go right down the right side of his cockpit. Again, another near miss. From his perspective, he thought it was a balloon until his wingman saw it turn and chase after his aircraft. So we're still having these issues. We still don't know why they can outperform our jets or where they're from. Now, what were the kind of anomalies that you and your colleagues witnessed inside your fighter jets when you saw these objects? What kind of things were they doing that defied your understanding? Yeah, so they would, you know, I'll start at the at the slow end and just tell you, they'd often be at completely stationary in the sky in very high winds, 120, 150 miles per hour winds, winds that cause us as pilots in our jets to struggle to stay in the area. And these objects would be perfectly still in the area. And we capture them on multiple sensors and not have an explanation for how they are able to do that. And yet then accelerate to hold at about 350 miles an hour. Uh, and they would do so for multiple hours. And then we'd also see them accelerate to 1.1 or 1.2 Mach uh, over the speed of sound. And while we have vehicles that can do perhaps all three of those different uh, regimes, we don't have one platform that can do all three of those seamlessly in that fashion, certainly not all day. Obviously, you can't talk about the full extent of the technical abilities of your aircraft, but you've got imaging systems, optical systems on board your jet that allow you to see things even at a, at a great distance. How close did you get to these objects? And did you see anything about those objects that might explain the kind of propulsion system were there propellers? Were there rockets? Were there some kind of jet engine that would explain what you were seeing? Well, as naturally inquisitive fighter pilots, we did try to get close to these objects to try to visually see them. Often it was very hard and we couldn't, even though all our sensors would be telling us where to look. But eventually uh, we almost hit one of these objects as it went right down uh, the right side of our wings within about uh, 50 feet uh, of the lead aircraft. And when we saw it, that's when we realized that these were truly something special. There were no, uh, there were no wings on these aircraft. There were no propellers. There was no exhaust coming out of the back. There was no back to these objects. They appeared spherical. They appeared uh, solid and consistent, and, and they would move without any type of energy expenditure, as far as we could see with our sensors. So, what do you say to the debunkers who? consistently claim that what you're seeing was probably some kind of balloon or something that can be prosaically explained? Well, I think that's just a misunderstanding of how these systems work. It's not just one sensor or one system that we're using to gather data on what we're seeing out there. It's a number of sensors that are that are collaborating and cooperating across multiple sensors, across multiple aircraft. And that allows us to get close enough to visually see these with our eyeballs. And so when we can track these objects and then we can sense them on our radar going at very high speeds, these are the same weapon systems or same radar systems that we use to guide our weapons and to keep us alive while we fly. And I have very high confidence that in the data that they're providing us. So you're getting, if you like, what I look for as a journalist when I'm interviewing somebody is corroboration. I'm looking for multiple independent objective strands of evidence that allow me to verify that something happened as described. What you're describing are, if you like, multiple forms of corroboration. There were different sensor systems that were operating that were allowing you to verify that whatever those objects were, they were real. Absolutely. And the way that our systems are now, all the aircraft are linked together. So when one person is seeing something, we're all seeing it. And that just increases our confidence in what, what we're reading off our systems. You know, we spend a great portion of our lives becoming experts in these systems, and it's no small thing to do. I would encourage people that are willing to dismiss this at face value to take some time to understand how, how important these sensor systems are to us, how much we train to execute on them and to understand the nuances in these systems so they can understand why we're so confident in what we see. Do you believe that 
there are pilots that do you believe that all pilots are reporting these sightings either commercial or military are, are we hearing about all of the sightings that are occurring oh absolutely not um, and i hear from pilots on a almost daily basis that are reporting this primarily commercial now that there are standing orders for reporting within the military uh, and every, for every one commercial pilot i talk to he tells me there's 10 more that just aren't reporting it right now so i think this is extremely common uh, more so than even uh, I've seen the data behind and that we really do deserve it to our aviation professionals to have proper reporting procedures in place so that they have the proper mechanisms to deal with the safety issue. I completely agree with you. I mean, you've got a ridiculous situation where the Pentagon's admitting the phenomenon, whatever it is, is real. And even if it's just UAVs, even if it's a foreign adversary's UAVs, unidentified aerial vehicles of some kind, that's a threat. That's a flight safety issue. Um, it's a exactly. laudable thing that the military has mandated that they be reported. What do you think, though, of the attempt by Dr. Sean Kirkpatrick of Arrow, the Pentagon's UFO UAP reporting office, which seems to be an attempt to play this whole issue down? Well, the reality is, is that you can submit an order and instruction within the military all day to tell the troops to do something, but unless there's buy-in at the operational level, at the command level, and there's training to implement it, and there's time spent, and there's feedback given from that reporting, then no, that there really hasn't been reporting implemented. There's just been a, a shout into the wind, unfortunately. And so when we when the All Domain Anomaly Resolution Office claims that they're not receiving reports that uh, are relevant to their investigation. I would encourage them to actually do more to encourage reporting through the services so that they have additional data. Uh, likewise, there is valuable data, I believe, in the commercial markets as well with the pilots that are what they are seeing on a regular basis. So at least in the military, there's been an expression of will by the leadership albeit somewhat flaccid uh, in reality, to actually get these things reported. What's the situation in commercial aviation? Is there a requirement imposed on pilots to report these objects? Is there a system, some kind of official system that allows these things to be reported? So there's a fine line in commercial aviation on how the reporting of this needs to be handled. Often what pilots are seeing are lights that are at very high altitudes or above the aircraft or perhaps operating around the aircraft, but outside of 10 nautical miles. In a lot of these cases, they don't necessarily fit the criteria for a aviation safety report that would go within certain existing aviation safety reporting systems that are held at NASA and FAA. Sometimes at individual companies such as United or Delta might have their own internal systems that they use to track instances. And so um, none of these necessarily fit the right methodology for reporting UAP, and it's not encouraged either. And so one of the things that we've done, uh, we've or we've communicated to, to folks on Capitol Hill, to our representatives to say, hey, here's a, here's a no-nonsense way that allows pilots to be able to report something if they see something. And we have to remember, a lot of these pilots have been flying for their entire lives. They have 30, 40, 50,000 hours of experience. These are some of our best human sensors that are flying over our heads every day and every night. We should listen to what they have to say and, and take it seriously. Yeah, you say that pilots are some of the best human sensors that we have, but the debunkers persistently say that you guys get confused, that you don't understand what you're seeing, and that they're capably uh, dismissible as prosaic objects, weather balloons. Um, what do you say to those debunkers who consistently tell you that you're not seeing what you think you're seeing? Well, I, I will not argue that we're not perfect and we're not superhuman. We certainly do make mistakes. Again, that's why it's so important that we have consistent reporting so that we can gather the data, that we can weed out the trash, and that we can really start to see the patterns that emerge. And there's no version of this where not collecting the data is the right thing to do. So when you testified to Congress in 2023, I think it was uh, July last year, you said that there were 30 witnesses who'd come forward to Americans for safe aerospace. What's the situation now? How many witnesses have you had come forward to your organization since? Uh, I don't have the exact number on top of my mind, but it, it's increased significantly uh, multiple since then, especially after the hearing, we've received many more reports and we're still working through them. 
Uh, it was never our intent at Americans for Safe Aerospace to serve as a, a witness reporting mechanism, uh, but pilots have been going to safearospace.org. They've been emailing me directly, and we've been receiving port, uh, reports nearly daily. Uh, we're, we are working with government stakeholders, with scientists, and researchers in order to receive these reports and to better understand what they mean from a human factors and a safety perspective. And we're working with government stakeholders that help us understand the ramifications of this from a national security perspective as well. And so this data is being used and it's being used to inform our policies that we're using to educate on Capitol Hill. There's a tendency, and I admit I'm as guilty of this as the next person, there's a tendency to see governments as monolithic organisations that speak with one voice. And I've been guilty, I think, of suggesting that all of government in the US is inclined to dismiss this whole UAP issue. But I've been quite heartened. I've heard from senior military commanders, people in the Air Force, people in the Navy, who are keen to take a leadership role on this, privately telling me that they are taking this UAP issue seriously. Is that your experience as well? Absolutely. There are a lot of people, both in the military now, as well as recent vet and veterans and other professionals as well, that are reaching out across law enforcement and other agencies that are interested and they want to know more and they want to understand this problem and they want to be a representative for this issue under their, uh, their current affiliation. And so, Although we might not be seeing drastic movements on this conversation on a day-by-day -day or week-by-week -week basis, every time that we move the conversation forward brings new people into the conversation. And a lot of those people are within the government, and they have some ways to move the conversation forward bit by bit. So it's all very important work. There's recently been an FOI. I think John Greenwald's Black Vault website put it up online, and there was a pilot off the coast of Florida from the Eglin Air Force Base who claimed that he'd seen an object that was hovering in the sky, allegedly looked like some kind of acorn, a bit, bit like the command module from the Apollo program he described. He drew a picture of it. The video was recorded by his jet. I think his gun camera recorded apparently very good video of the object. The FOI revealed that the video existed, but we're told that that video can't be released because of national security. What do you think of that kind of decision? Is it because, is it legitimate to keep that kind of video confidential because it might reveal capabilities of the gun camera vision of the, of the jet fighter? Or do you think that kind of video should be being released? That's a, that's a great question. So I'm not an expert in declassification methodology, but I will say that I have seen in the past the ability to declassify visual uh, information by blacking out some of the more um, secretive information. So if this is truly just a, a regular uh, video, um, you would think it would be relatively easy to uh, black out the information that would be of concern. However, my understanding is that UAP related information is classified uh, via the security classification guidelines that govern UAP. And so although they may classify, they may block all the relevant information as it relates to the aircraft or the F-22, right now we would expect them to maintain classification status due to that security classification guideline. So all that to mean is that if they see something they can't explain, they're automatically going to classify it, and that's the end of the conversation. Yeah, but Ryan, according to the Arrow recently departed boss, Dr. Sean Kirkpatrick, this is all piffle and nonsense anyway. I mean, UAPs appear to be capable of prosaic explanation. He hasn't seen a shred of evidence, he says, to justify any conclusion that this is non-human. Are we being led astray if the military is using security classifications to gag, to censor public knowledge of what's really being recorded by the U.S. military? Well, I, I absolutely believe that that's likely the case, uh, as you suggest at the end there. But, you know, ultimately, the, the public is not going to be satisfied in this conversation until there's some justification to the, the dismissal of this conversation that they provided in their recent reports. Um, the, the general public is not going to be satisfied by saying the, the DOD investigated itself and we, we determined that there's nothing going on here. Um, that's not the level of trust that we have in our institutions right now, and we shouldn't expect that level of trust to be anywhere in our future. One of the things that I thought was very telling, Ryan, was that the Navy actually did acknowledge 
officially that it had 11 near misses with UAP that required evasive action and triggered mandatory safety reports between 2004 and 2021. 11 near misses with fighter jet aircraft or with military aircraft. That's a huge concern, isn't it? Oh, absolutely. I mean, you're looking at somewhere over north of $350 million worth of assets at that number if they were lost, never mind the lives. We take those types of incidents very serious as aviators, and we do a lot of work to mitigate those safety risks as part of our flight training. And so for us, it's fundamental that we do not ignore these risks. We need to have a method to report them. Now, one of the things that I think people have forgotten is that the uh, Deputy Director of the Office of Naval Intelligence in testimony to Congress, Scott Bray, gave evidence, I think back in 2021, when he and Ronald Moultrie first gave evidence to the Congress, that these objects, whatever they are that you and your colleagues were seeing, they couldn't be explained away as part of some black program, some secret program within the US government. Now, the significance of that is it can only then be one of two things. Either a foreign adversary is deploying technology that, on your account, is way beyond the known capabilities of terrestrial technology, using propulsion systems, hovering methods that we just don't yet understand, or it's something else, possibly non-human. Exactly. And, you know, either one of those answers requires our attention. And we're not seeing that demonstrated by our government right now. As again, with these incidents that we've had over Langley recently, we've had over a thousand incursions of unknown objects over one of our critical bases. This is unacceptable from a national security perspective. When does it rise to a level of attention that requires action? When it happens over the White House? I'm not sure, but it's getting closer. Maybe it'll take a landing on the White House lawn, Ryan. We'll see. So thank you very much, Ryan, for joining Reality Check. I think we're going to have to wait and see whatever official report comes out about the Langley Air Force Base drones, but I think it was very important for us to put them in context with what you and your colleagues experienced and what fighter jet pilots are still continuing to experience just off the Virginia coast there in a really crucial part of American defence aerospace. Thank you very much for giving us your wisdom. Thank you so much for having me here, Ross, and I really appreciate your attention on this critical national security issue. It is a critical national security issue, isn't it? But you wouldn't think that from some of the comments we've had recently from the body that we trust inside the Pentagon to do that kind of investigation. As it turns out, there is action happening in Congress, and I'm delighted to bring on Reality Check Congressman Glenn Grothman who's from Wisconsin, he's a Republican from Wisconsin. And together with another of his colleagues, he's come up with a proposed new piece of legislation called the Safe Airspace for Americans Act. Congressman, welcome to Reality Check. What can you tell us about this proposed legislation? Well, it's one of those bipartisan things we don't see enough of in Congress. You're right. Uh, we're doing it with Robert Garcia from California. We're trying to provide protection for everybody so that they're not afraid to come forward with sightings of unidentified phenomena, okay, what we used to call UFOs. And it applies not only to pilots themselves, but to air traffic controllers, flight attendants, anybody. Because we, we have done enough uh, investigating that we know that there's a lot going on out there. And we, we know that some pilots have seen things that they consider suspicious, both over the Pacific Ocean and the, over the Atlantic Ocean. And we feel that if more people were able to report, because right now they're afraid that some people think they're crazy, right? And if you're a pilot, you want to have your job for the next 30 years, you don't want to have in your record that, wow, this weirdo is claiming you saw UFOs. We want to say, hey, you're not getting, getting in trouble for this. We want you to report it to the uh, uh, FAA and... Uh, you know, compile the data and see what more we can find out. Now, what I find most admirable about the legislation you're proposing is you're bringing in proposed protections for people who come forward. How would people who do come forward with evidence of sightings be protected? Oh, they, they can't harm them in any way in their job. And another part of the legislation 
is we have to do outreach to all the relevant parties, the flight attendants, the pilots, and that sort of thing. So they know they're not going to get in trouble and know where they're supposed to report things if they do see something unusual. So that includes things like, as I understand it, that you're not allowed to use the fact that somebody's made a sighting uh, to give them an adverse medical certificate and stop them from exactly, flying. Exactly, exactly. We don't want to have closed-minded people say, oh, there must be something wrong with Joe over there. He saw an unidentified flying object. Hey, wait a minute. Lots of people have seen these. And the more sightings that we can compile, the better off we'll be. Just speaking broadly, sir, where do you stand on the UAP phenomenon? I know your committee, uh, you're on the, um, as I understand it, you're on the National Security Subcommittee of the Oversight and Accountability Committee. In fact, you're the chairman of the Subcommittee on National Security for the Border and Foreign Affairs. So that makes the issue of uh, illegal incursions into US airspace an important one for you. How big an issue is the issue of UAPs, unidentified anomalous phenomena, for you and your colleagues in that National Security Subcommittee? We keep getting questions on it, and it's very important because we've had credible people, Air Force pilots, Navy pilots, see things that can't be explained. So there's something going on out there. There's something our government's hiding from us. We keep tracking down more government bureaucrats who hopefully will give us the final answer. And we're going to continue to do that. But we do believe something's going on there, whether it's uh, something our own government is doing, whether it's something a foreign government is doing, whether it genuinely is something from, you know, uh, another planet. We'd like to know because something's going on and we are not given the appropriate answers. Does it frustrate you that you're a congressman? You're, you're supposedly, right. I, I mean no disrespect, but, you know, Congress is king. You guys are meant to be the ones who hold the executive accountable, and yet you've got sections of the military who seem to take a view that they're not having to give information to Congress. One of the, the essential complaints that's been put forward by David Grush, the whistleblower who's come forward to your committee and others in the Congress, is that there is information that's being withheld from Congress. Is that an issue of concern for you? Well, it is. It's not unusual. You know, all sorts of parts of the government, it seems like their goal is not to let Congress know what's going on and not let the public what's going on. We keep getting suggestions of new people to interview. And whenever we interview new people, usually behind closed doors, they don't have the answers we're looking for. And then we have to go to another level. I'm sure we're going to have another hearing here as we track down more people who will be able to give us more information. So just coming back for a moment to your Safe Airspace for Americans Act, it does have bipartisan support. Are you confident it's going to get through the House? I'd be very disappointed if it doesn't get through the House. I think it'll get through the House. And we'll perhaps add more provisions as time goes on. And do you think it'll, it'll go through in its current form? I mean, it's actually quite important that the legislation does go through because I see you've got annual reporting requirements, you've got prohibitions on reprisals. This is a gutsy piece of legislation. Why is it necessary? Have you seen evidence that pilots are being intimidated? We just hear it anecdotally, you know, when we've talked to the pilots who have seen things, they know there are other pilots who saw it as well, but they're not coming forward. Why is that? You know why that is. It's because they're afraid they have a supervisor who's going to say, oh, you know, Joe claims he saw a, a flying object. So we hear it from, from pilots, that sort of thing. And uh, we know there's a concern out there. So we've got this situation at the moment where the military have essentially mandated that pilots now have to report incidents that they see, UAP sightings. But up until now, there's been no requirement placed on private pilots and commercial pilots to come forward. Would your legislation mandate sightings? Would it require pilots to report what they see, as well as other aviation staff? Well, I don't really think you, you can ever, it'd be tough to implement something saying you had to go forward. However, we feel if the legislation passes, it'll certainly make it more likely that somebody on a commercial airline will report it. And of course, it's people in the private sector who sometimes have even more concerns 
about, you know, if you work for Delta or work for United or what have you, uh, concerns that their company may not view uh, citing favorably. So we want to make sure they get the, the get the appropriate protections. Now, so we talked earlier about the fact that there are some in government who clearly don't want Congress to hold them to account. And it's interesting, one of the things that I've been taking a very close look at is the incidents that have been reported using freedom of information laws, notably incidents involving US Air Force pilots or Navy pilots encountering objects way out over the ocean and often having quite dangerous encounters. We both know Ryan Graves, whom I know has been liaising with you on this proposed legislation. Ryan's described incidents that he's aware of involving pilots off the east coast of America in Navy training areas where there's been alleged near misses, objects, in fact, on one occasion, an object flew at extraordinary speed between two fighter aircraft. I guess what I'm looking for here is, by any definition, sir, those are flight safety issues. And because we're talking about pilots training in sensitive, high secure training areas, it's also a national security issue, which I'm sure is something that's a focus for you with your subcommittee and the oversight committee. Absolutely. And uh, that is another reason to be concerned. I think the major re reason to be concerned is just you'd like to know what's going on out there, right? Obviously, there's something going on. The government is not gung-ho on informing the American public. But you're right. If you assume something's going on, you always have the danger of something happened running into another aircraft, uh, that sort of thing. There's an incident that one of your colleagues, uh, uh, Florida uh, Congressman Matt Gates, was involved in investigating back in um, uh, early middle last year. There was an incident that took place off the coast of Florida, I think in the Gulf of Mexico, where a large object was seen by the pilot of what was probably an F-22 Raptor, like one of the top new fighter stealth aircraft that we now have. He saw what he describes as something that looked cone-shaped, shaped essentially like a command module from the Apollo missions hovering in the air. And he was essentially two seconds at the speed he was flying. He was two seconds from that object and his sensor systems were disabled in some way by the object. He drew a picture of the object, which is just extraordinary. And more importantly, he secured gun camera vision, video of the object. Now, we know that this incident happened, sir, because the US Air Force has been forced to release a report that was written uh, to the uh, Defence Department detailing this incident. But we know that pretty much everything about it has been redacted, has been censored, including the video. Now, I, I know we have to balance national security. It's an important thing. We don't want to give away the capabilities of our jet fighters, the capabilities of our sensor systems. But does the degree of secrecy, the degree of confidentiality that we're constantly encountering cause you concern? Of course it bothers me. Because if they're not bringing something forth, it means they're hiding something. And you have to wonder, why are they hiding it? Right. And if Matt Gates says it, sees it, other people presumably saw it too. Right. So it's not like you're dealing with something that is secret from all the public. You just don't want the public at large to know about it. Now, there's that incident. And then there's another incident I can tell you about, sir. We've actually found a witness for an incident that took place very recently uh, at Langley Air Force Base, which is, uh, as you know, uh, very much in, in Virginia. So it's essentially one of the forward bases that defends Washington, D.C., a very, very sensitive area of airspace. And the official position seems to be that what we're seeing were benign prosaic drone technology that was seen hovering over the base. We found a witness who actually videoed those objects 
And that witness does not accept that what they saw was a standard commercial or even military drone. That he believes that the objects were acting completely anomalously and uh, utterly inconsistently with the kind of technology that we all know exists with helicopters, aircraft, or modern drone technology. Yet again, we're being told that this incident is under investigation, and I can only anticipate that we'll be told that it's all classified and we're not allowed to know about it. Are you confident that your committee, your subcommittee for national security is getting all the answers that it needs? Because what, what can we do to help you as a congressman get the help that you need to, to well, find out for the American public what on earth is going on? Right. You, you can afford me the information on the sighting in Langley, but we just have to keep bringing in more and more government employees here till we get the truth. Right. I mean, when people have seen things, you know something's going on out there, and it's the nature of government to hide things from the public. And we just have to, we've had several private uh, meetings with government personnel who continue to kind of play uh, hide the ball on this. But we're going to continue to have more, more hearings and ask for more suggestions as to who we should talk to instead until this stuff has been made public. Because the public should know. The people are seeing it, right? They should know, is this something to be concerned about? That This is new American technology. What's going on? So we're not going to stop until we get to the bottom of it. And, sir, I want to emphasise none of us, we're all patriots. We all care deeply about our country and we want our servicemen and women to stay safe. So there are things that don't need to be revealed and shouldn't be revealed when we're talking about classified military technology. But I just want to read you something that Representative Matt Gates said after he actually saw the video at Eglin Air Force Base that's still being classified from the American public. Uh, Representative Gates said, quote, the image was of something that I'm not able to attach to any human capability, either from the United States or from any of our adversaries. And I'm somewhat informed on the matter, having served on the Armed Services Committee for seven years, having served on the committee that oversees DARPA, the Defence Advanced Research Projects Agency, and Advanced Technologies for several years. I mean, so there's one of your colleagues basically saying that what he saw is anomalous. And we're not allowed to see it. Are you? We will continue to be more aggressive uh, in getting information out. What bothers me in particular is there's information going back many years that still hasn't been released. And even if they're not going to uh, give us information on something that happened in the last few months, why won't they give us things that happened 20 years ago? So I think... Before we come to an end, sir, there was a, a report from earlier mid-March. The NORTHCOM Commander-in-Chief, a U.S. Air Force General, Gregory Guillot, said that there are likely more than 1,000 incursions by unmanned aerial aircraft systems along the U.S.-Mexico border alone each month. He, he gave this testimony at a Senate Armed Services Committee meeting. Now, you're on the National Security Border Subcommittee for the Oversight Committee. What, what can be done about these UAV systems if, in fact, they are UAV systems? I mean, we obviously don't know for sure because it's all being classified. Well, it wouldn't su surprise me that things are going on on the Mexican border, in part because there's such activity there uh, involving uh, the Mexican drug gangs and drug cartels, right? And we've been told when I've been down there, that frequently the cartels have access to technology that is sometimes uh, more advanced than what the U.S. government itself can, uh, can obtain. So it wouldn't surprise me if we see all sorts of things at the southern border for that reason. These cartels have almost unlimited wealth, and it's unfortunate when you hear our Border Patrol say that they have things that our own government can't afford, or at least that our Border Patrol feels that they cannot afford. Finally, sir, you as a member of a key committee obviously get access to things that we, the public, aren't allowed to see. Have you seen evidence that's given you sufficient cause to think that 
just maybe there is an explanation for the phenomenon of UAPs that might indeed be non-human? No, I do not at this point. Although, you know, I keep an open mind. And like I said, it's apparent the government is holding back some stuff. Do you hold out the possibility that there is such an explanation behind all of this? And can you think of any good reason why it would be being kept secret from the American public? I don't know. I think it's the nature of government to keep the public in the dark. I think mean, that's true of every government agency. Uh, and it wouldn't surprise me. Nothing would surprise me. I'll put it that way, just because we've seen unusual sightings from so many people who are top flight people. Well, Congressman Glenn Grothman, I have to say we all congratulate you on the proposed legislation for the uh, Safe Airspace for Americans Act. We hope it gets through the House. And we, uh, we're on your back, making sure that you keep on pushing for greater disclosure yeah. and transparency on whatever there is going on behind the dark scenes. Well, absolutely. Check in again in a couple of months, and hopefully I'll have more information for you. Thank you very much, sir. OK, so that's the congressman's position. Uh, like a lot of people in Congress, the congressman's bound by essentially the information he gets. I think all of us have this impression that, that congressional representatives are omnipotent and they have the power to dial up whomever they want from the executive to get answers. Believe me, I know they're as frustrated as we are that they have difficulties getting answers to some of the secrets we'd all like to know about. Now, before I go today, we've got a few questions from viewers that I'd like to answer. The first one is, Ross, why are all these stories emerging from mostly Western countries? I've never heard anything from India and Pakistan, for example, and both are nuclear powers. Well, let me tell you, Adnan Khan Frank, there are things going on in India and Pakistan. By golly, there are. I'm in touch with people, nuclear scientists, from both countries. Both countries have got the same problems we're seeing in the US, the UK, Europe, any country with nuclear facilities, nuclear weapons. There are anomalous objects buzzing, Indian and Pakistani nuclear facilities. And just recently, there's been publicity in the Indian press, which I hope to report about soon, where there have been objects videoed by policemen and reported on by policemen over Indian nuclear facilities. There's a genuine concern about this. And in fact, it's got to the political level in, in India, where reports have been made to the Indian government. And I'm currently in touch with uh, journalists and investigators in India who are trying to get to the bottom of this. Yet again, one of the problems is there's so much secrecy, for good reason, surrounding nuclear weapons and nuclear power facilities, that the authorities just try and lock everything up in secret tape and try and keep us all in the dark. Well, let me tell you, we're digging, and we're going to hopefully get some answers for you on that very soon. Uh, the next question is from Patrick Glennon. Uh, what about the congressional hearings? It's gone very quiet. Look, I know there is a deep mood of despondency right now in UAP social media. Everybody thinks that, look, I have to say, everybody seems to think that the UAP issue is a form of entertainment and there needs to be kind of a weekly rollout of the next best thing. This takes time. Uh, I, I'm not at all deterred or in any way worried about the pace of change. There are enormous things underway in Congress. We've just reported on one of them, the Americans for Safe Airspace Act. That's an incredibly important piece of legislation because what it's going to do is mandate to some degree, a protection of people in the aviation industry so that they don't suffer retribution for coming forward. I just recently had a pilot visit my home here in Australia who is a um, pilot for a major airline that does couriers of packages all around the world. I will, I'll leave you to guess who that might be. The pilot described to me an anomalous incident that took place over the Pacific Ocean en route to a particular country. He showed me video of what he'd seen, and he wanted me to know about it because he was concerned that, frankly, he's going to suffer retribution for using his mobile phone camera in the cockpit. Apparently, there are regulations against doing that. So he was worried about losing his job 
And for that reason, he hadn't reported what he'd seen to his bosses. And he's even concerned about forwarding it on to the Federal Aviation Authority because then it might blow back on him if they then start investigating. So this is why there are things happening right now in Congress. There are moves afoot to, as well as get this legislation passed, there are still moves afoot for hearings. And there are whistleblowers in the works who are sitting there d- d- waiting for approval from DOPSA, the Defence Office Pre-Publication Security Review Team, to make a decision about whether or not they can feel OK about coming forward. These things just take time. It's not a weekly publicity event. You know, We're not going to put out a press release every week telling you what's happening, because by its very nature, a lot of this is covert and stealthy. A lot of people are frightened about coming forward, so they're testifying in camera, in secret, to congressional committees. But I can tell you there's a lot happening. I'm very optimistic. Uh, finally, the next question's from Will Gallison. It seems the threat must be more insidious than merely losing one's security clearance. He's talking here about the threat to people who are thinking about coming forward, the whistleblowers. He asks, there are surely people who've worked in these legacy programs who've put away enough money to retire and have no need to maintain a security clearance. This has been going on since the 1940s at least, so there must be many people who were involved and who are now in their 70s, 80s and 90s. What do they have to lose? And the answer is, not a great deal. You're absolutely right. And a lot of those people have come forward. I'm thinking of also, I mean, I'm thinking of the people, I mean, you've got a former CIA director, uh, Roscoe Hillencotter, who actually created a UFO advocacy transparency organisation. Throughout history, we seem to forget there have been brave people who've come forward. David Grush is not the first. There have been people who've come forward from within the military, within the intelligence community, who've spoken publicly about what they know. The problem is they get walloped. They get hammered with a massive discrediting campaign. And so there are a lot of people whom I suspect are real who have come forward with authentic claims and they've been dismissed because their claims do not get traction. And this brings us back to the good work of people like Congressman Grothman. It's absolutely vital that we all put pressure on our congressional representatives, our senators, our congressmen, our congresswomen, and demand that they keep on asking questions about the UAP issue. They won't ask if they don't know that this is an issue that we're all worried about. And this is where politics works. The wheel that squeaks gets the grease. So they're they're not going to worry about the issue of UAPs unless All of you, hammer them about it. So hammer them about it. Exercise your congressional rights. Write a good old-fashioned letter. Let your congressional representative, your senator, know this matters. That's all this week for Reality Check. It's been a pleasure catching up with you. I hope you enjoyed this week's show. See you next time. Thanks for watching. Go to joinnn.com to find NewsNation on your television provider. And please don't forget to click that red subscribe button to ensure you get more of NewsNation's unbiased and fact-driven news coverage.